be here now. Just be here now. Hi, everyone. Raghu back with Mind Rolling. And uh, we were just figuring out when we last met up. Nancy Collier, welcome to the show. Happy to be back. Great to have you. Um, Well, Nancy has this. Everyone who's listening uh, will have this problem. It's it's (laughs) the the universal problem. So Nancy wrote a, a great book called uh, Can't Stop Thinking. Or shouldn't it have a question mark? Can't Stop Thinking? Read this book. It's true. <laughs> I think it's self-explanatory. I don't think we need the question mark, but I suppose yeah, we right. could use it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the last time we chatted on Mind Rolling, Nancy and I, uh, we it was a, a really... Great. I loved the book. It was called The Power of Off, you know, around the path, spirituality and technology and so on. And uh, although it's five years ago, it's probably coming truer uh, in some of the things that were in that book around uh, how we use technology uh, in a way that's uh, mostly around the simple gratifications that we can't seem to get by just being. So... Uh, but we'll have a link to that book in the show notes because it's great. And uh, so where what have we been doing, Nancy, in these last five years? <laughs> well, staying alive, that's a good thing, right? Yeah, we were just talking about gratitude just to get yeah. to be in the game, those. Um, so professionally... Um, this book that came after The Power of All, Can't Stop Thinking, seemed to be a kind of natural progression from The Power of All because mm. it's another addiction, right? I, I look, I love to look at addictions and everything we use to avoid the present moment. And thinking is one of those things. Um, and so I got really interested in what's whatever creates suffering or whatever gets in the way of our well-being. And having been a therapist for nearly 30 years, Mm -hmm. obviously I see a lot of thinking and faulty thinking and too much thinking and inability to find the spaces between thoughts and this identification with thinking and all Mm -hmm. sorts of, um, ways that we relate to our own thoughts that cause pain. Yeah. But there is a little difference to me. It's uh, the difference being that in terms of addiction, um, just the endemic nature of that process Mm -hmm. that's built into humans for, and there's all sorts of, some of which you discuss in in the book, uh, reasons and, um, so there's a way in which how you come into the, this is just my thoughts how you come into this life the parents that you have the cultural uh, the societal conditions the culture all of it create this and especially karma that brings you here that still is unfinished business that uh gives one person the predilection to be consumed like a forest fire and others not so consumed um the the i always think of the one person that comes to mind so easily is adya shanti do you know who that is uh, you know i've yeah. worked with him for years and years uh-huh. yeah yeah of course of course sorry but uh he just realized this thing You know, at a very early age, he could not believe, I've told this story before, but it's well worth repeating. 
He could not believe his parents and their friends in gatherings when he was very small, four, five, six, something. He, he couldn't believe how uh, off the wall they were, either angry or happy in a way that was an exuberance that was unfounded, so to speak. <laughs> Anyhow, he couldn't figure it out until he, uh, I think five or six years later, maybe just becoming a teenager, I think he said. He said, I suddenly realized what the problem was with these people. They believe their thoughts. And that set him, you know, he had a deep understanding at an early age of that, and that set him off into a, a major meditative practice, which only worked out when he quit <laughs> because he was trying so much. And he quit then, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So it's a lovely, lovely mm -hmm. story. But yeah, the, the nature is, is an, nature is a big part of this, I think. It is, and I think it's what makes it so tricky because again it is so endemic to who we are right and also because it is so helpful to think <laughs> we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater yeah. it's as you know a question of you know the mind becoming our servant not our master it's a it's the trick of how do we want to be in relationship with our thoughts? Because they are so helpful. And I think it's also about uh, wrestling free from the absolute faith that the way to peace is through more thinking. You know, this idea that we are conditioned with from the moment we are born that thinking will make everything better. Think more about it. You know, once we suffer enough at the hands of our own thoughts, um, we can wake up to realize that if we really want peace, uh, the way there is probably not more thinking about something we've thought about 112,000 times. Mm -hmm. So we lose a kind of reverence for our thoughts. They're, they don't have to be true. They don't have to be important. They probably won't bring us peace. And probably we won't figure out at this stage what it is, whatever we want to figure out. We may have to just say we don't know. That may be our, our destination. Yeah. Um, at the very beginning, uh, you talk about just uh, here, just quoting you at the core, our stress, <clears throat> excuse me, stress, anxiety, and chronic discontent are caused by one thing, the way we relate to our thoughts. It's our relationship with thought that makes us suffer. I mean, that is the core of it all, as far as I'm, I'm concerned, because then uh, how you relate is where, what perspective you're coming from, and, and you start to talk about that, but uh, yeah, talk about... Yeah, changing our yeah, perspective, right? Right. And a lot of that, as you know, is about creating some separation from our thoughts, right? If we are fully identified with our thoughts, there's no us and thought. So we're just dragged around like a, you know, a bone in a dog's mouth. Wherever our thoughts go, we go, and there's no separation. What the book teaches is the very basic element of moving from being thought to being the listener of thought. Now I'm the one listening to this crazy radio station playing all the time. And what do I do? I want to move towards that radio? Do I want to turn the channel? Do I even really care what's playing, right? What is my relationship with what's coming down the pike here? Uh, the You know, this ticker tape of thought. I have to get that separation first before anything new can happen, mm. right? Then, and, you know, part of what is so mixed up about self-help is that self-help teaches us, you know, replace the negative thought with a positive thought have affirmations, have 
mantras and so on. And, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a bit like putting a hat on dirty hair. You know, it's lovely. But when the going gets tough, the dirty hair is still there. So um, we're not getting under the problem, which is at the deepest level, it doesn't really matter, you know, what your thoughts are saying. They might say uh, crazy things. They might say helpful things. They might say um, mean things. But if you're not your thoughts, then you're not in this constant battle with your thoughts that they have to be a certain way. They have to be positive in order for us to be well. They have to be on our side for us to like ourselves. I don't want my well-being to depend upon being able to better control the content of my thought. So what I'm teaching in the book is how to wear our thoughts more like a loose garment. Oh, okay. Crazy thoughts are appearing now. Oh, now thoughts I like. Oh, now. And we get better at being in relationship with our thoughts in the sense of, yeah, I'm not that interested in that thought or no, you can't terrify me or no, I'm not really interested in preparing for the worst. I'm going to come back to this present moment and all these sorts of ways that we can be in relationship with thought and maintain a sense of well-being no matter what they're up to. Hmm. You do you do talk about uh separating oneself from identification with the thought, whatever it may be. And therein, to me, a, a potential problem can come up. And, and you use the term witness, which Ramdas, that was a big thing, especially when he first came back before there was a ubiquitous term mindfulness, right? And so the witness, which uh, Gurdjieff and Aspensky, um, that's where he got that from. And, but it's a tricky slope, is it not? In terms of you're just, it's spiritual bypass where you're witnessing and you're continuing to judge, criticize, talk to yourself in ways that you wouldn't talk to anybody else. Well, that is the first layer, which is this witness is just a little bit trickier set of thoughts, right? We, We think it's, you know, free of identification, but it's just one step back. It's noticing the thoughts, as you're saying, insightfully, but it has all sorts of thoughts about the thoughts. So it's not really, we're not really anywhere. So our, our critic has slipped inside our witness, right? So yeah, it's a form of bypassing. I would also say that ultimately we need more than a witness. Because we are both the absolute and the relative. So, yes, it's just thought. But when we get into thoughts that are not about, let's say, what's for dinner or what movie do I want to watch? And we're talking about thoughts that carry heavy duty emotional experiences and trauma. Right. It's not just thought. They have all sorts of layers of lived heartbreak and and so on so we have to move past just oh it's just thought to first a sense of allowing whatever the thoughts are trying to protect us from whatever the fear that the thoughts carry or the need to control or the repeating so that we keep ourselves safe or thoughts are up to something They're trying to protect us, right? Thoughts are there because they only know one way to keep us safe, and that's through more thinking. So first we have to allow what is the intention in this thought. And then we have to also get on, this is so crazy, but get on the side of the thoughts. Even when the thoughts are seemingly damaging, let's say they're critical, They're trying to criticize us to keep us from being judged. We'll do it. We'll tell us what's wrong with us so that we're not told and humiliated and so on. So there's a process in between just witnessing thoughts, right? What What is that thought? 
really trying to do with itself. And then we don't necessarily have to engage with it because we have a deeper understanding of what it's after and we have compassion for the thought. So two, the thoughts might be going to what if or catastrophizing because they think that's the only way to protect us from that thing happening. Mistaken belief, right? But we have to unravel that. Or for example, the mind doesn't know that we are infinite awareness and the mind exists within that awareness. We're aware of that mind. It imagines like Descartes that that is the sole center of our existence. So if it stops thinking, there's an existential void, right? I only feel myself alive if I'm thinking. So it's busyness is trying to maintain existence. So first we have to really get in the shoes of these obsessive thoughts and this mind that's so frightened of not existing and then we can say, oh, look at that. Look at that sweetheart doing that thing that it thinks is helping us. And we get it that it's not. Mm-hmm. The, the byword you just used, though, was, uh, for me, was compassion. That alongside of a witness that isn't based in, you know, ego, m- mind, our story, that we're, the I is coming from. I mean, Ramdas called it uh, loving awareness. And uh, I like to think that uh, from that place where there's real compassion for yourself, for oneself, and then that can extend outward and include some of these men, much of these thoughts that are uh, potentially, uh, as you say, uh, take over our life and wreak havoc on our experience. Yeah. That's strong words, but really true, no? Really true. And when you hear, you know, I have the front seat as a therapist, I, you know, what uh, yeah, people right. are really putting themselves through and this torturous entity when we believe these thoughts and, again, don't have compassion for this terrified animal that is our monkey mind, right? Then, then we are really in harm's way. Those two, yeah. you know, a combination of believing it and not loving it. Wow, we're we're, we're sitting there in the hot seat, you know. Mm. And I think that part of what's tricky about you know mindfulness these days, as you well point out, there is that. It so often is without that component of sweetness towards this human condition yeah. of, of believing that we are mind and being so intertwined with our thoughts that we can't get something separate, which is a safe place from which to witness the thoughts. We are so challenged with this incredible instrument. And so until we, you know, our heart breaks for uh, the struggle of that, um, then it's really all, as you say, just, it's really just another ego trip. It's now I'm really good at mindfulness. You know, now I'm a mindfulness expert. Yeah. And um, that's not really of much use to us. Do you, I mean, I know you do, but maybe it would help if, Uh, people listening or watching some real world examples that you have come across as you say you're seeing people day in and day out and and you probably have a waiting list as well because the amount of stress uh, by virtue of coming from every corner no matter if it isn't even directly your life you're not threatened by what's going on with inflation, say, or you manage to somehow distance yourself. I mean, you can't get to the pandemic, distance from the war. You can't get around enough of these things. So do you have, you know, just some some examples? Yeah. Well, living right now, one of the big aspects of thinking that I see is 
this catastrophizing. Mm. Right? What happens when we can't breathe the air? What happens when the fish are all poisoned? What happens when democracy goes away? What happens when, 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 right? Mm -hmm. So right now, that is a huge problem going on with anxiety. And what's happening is that people are feeling so out of control so out of control in their lives that they're doubling down harder on thinking, right? I'm going to control it. I'll figure out everything I can do. I'll figure out any way to think about it that gives me a sense of ground in this groundlessness. And so what I'm always all day working with people is on is we can do what we can do in this moment. We can be in this present moment, and that's our best protection for anything that will come down the pipe. So let's work on getting okay here, having a present moment that's still okay, right? And then if that thing comes down the road towards us, we're going to work with that when it comes. So again, it's this practice of coming back to the present moment and not allowing that fear that what if, what if, what if, to kidnap our present moment, right? I hear all day long about these terrors, these things that are really not up to us to a large extent. So when we're faced with that, we keep coming back to, am I okay in this moment, right? Am I doing everything I can in this moment to keep myself safe? And then can I trust that if anything comes, towards me later on, right, that I'll be present with that and I'll do the best I can with what is not in my hand. And that's the piece, you know, that is so hard for us, which is it's not up to me entirely. I do my part. But one thing I know is if I keep obsessing about what could go wrong and all the things in the world that are very scary right now, right? What what I'm sure I'm going to get to do is live these catastrophes twice. I'm going to live it now, and I might live it in the future, but I'm sure I'll get to, sorry, live it once. If it never comes to pass, I never have to live it, but this way I guarantee I'll get to live it once, maybe twice if it does happen. <laughs> but what what I've found over, again, you know, many years is that However we've imagined these catastrophes, they don't happen ever in the way we imagine. They don't. So what we can do is come back to this present moment. Am I doing everything I can do? And now I surrender. The whole thing is not up to me. And that has to become a kind of okay place where I get more comfortable with not knowing. Mm -hmm. I have to get comfortable there. You know, something always strikes me these days that we're doing so much to eliminate discomfort. The more uncomfortable we get, the more allergic we get to the idea of being uncomfortable. You know, if we say Mm -hmm. something, you know, that makes someone else uncomfortable. Oh, God, you know, no one should be uncomfortable. Well, I I think it should be the opposite. I think we really need to start building our resilience in discomfort. Big time. Because, yeah, something is broken that our solution to this is eliminate discomfort from life as discomfort ramps up. It's madness, really. And we're losing, it's almost like we're breeding out of ourselves the capacity to stay and be present in what is much of life, not comfortable. Unpleasant. Yes. <laughs> and it won't kill us, right? <laughs> right. That's but what boy, my mother are we said. afraid of that. <laughs> it won't kill you, <laughs> my mother yeah. used to say. What, are you made of paper when it's <laughs> raining, right? Yeah, right. That's it. But it is a strange sort of response that we're having, you know, get rid of the discomfort as as more and more feels uncomfortable. 
And God forbid one should say something that makes someone else uncomfortable. But that's a faulty solution, right? So in the same way, the fact that things are uncomfortable or feel groundless or feel out of our control, yeah, okay, so can I hang out in that and be okay? Yeah. So that leads us to the next part of this. Uh, actually, what you were talking about is so extraordinarily important of being present in the moment. And basically, we're talking about be here now. He was kind of right about that back then. Kind of. Yeah. But uh, to to get there and to really be able to even get as we were talking about, in, into a witness perspective that is not uh, run by your judge uh, and jury and being able to bring compassion into it. So we, we got that makes a lot of sense. And so the, this uh, next ingredient, which begins one thinking, okay, I think it you probably need to practice whatever it is in order for us to transform it's not going to be wished and you're not going to be you know so uh, awareness practice Uh, let's talk about that right and everything is practice you know there's Mm. no i mean some people that's not true right Eckhart Tolle woke up on the bench you know so it does happen but you know more often than not it's little glimpses many times and you know i had a moment where Some years ago, I was walking through the park. It was a beautiful day. And it was just about this time of year. Spring was blooming. And I was deep down the rabbit hole going over and over and over a conversation I'd had with a partner and what he said and what I said. And I was right and why I was right. And, you know, I looked up and I think I saw a plum tree. And I saw in that moment that I was creating my own suffering, that I had taken myself to hell. And I got something in that moment, something awakened, where I saw myself down the rabbit hole and choosing in that moment to either stay or leave the rabbit hole. And that I would have to leave that conversation I was rehashing to a courtroom, a judge and jury of one in my own mind of who was right. Um, I'd have to leave it and choose now, choose this breath, choose this perfume in the air, choose the sensation in my feet and so on. And That became a kind of pivotal moment for me where the practice of returning to the present moment and leaving whatever the obsessive uh, rumination was, um, it was an active choice I would make again and again and again. And still to this day, obviously with much more uh, ease and without that sort of, oh my gosh, come back kind of effort to it. Now it's just built into the system where I'm coming back and coming back because again, you know, the seduction of thought is a real thing. So the practice, whether we're doing it in a meditative way where we're actually witnessing thought 10, 15 minutes a day, or we're doing it all throughout the day where we're checking in, am I here? Am I here? Come back, come back, come back. Take this breath, right? It has to translate to action, attentional action. And then from there, you know, there is also this move out into the identification with awareness, right? So what is this spaciousness within which this whole dance is happening? Right. That, you know, rather than, for example, rather than we are inside this body, right, this body is within us. Rather than we are these thoughts, these thoughts happen within this space that we are. Right. So we, we practice not just 
the coming back to the present moment. But then you can imagine it as the backward step or the opening up from there to the awareness, spaciousness, whatever you want to call it, compassion, love, um, presence, within which this ragu dances, Nancy dances, the human, the relative, it all happens. But that's, again, a practice. Uh, first of all, you talked about choice. You talked about choice of uh, continuing to indulge in righteousness. Basically, I'm right, the partner's not, you know, that we've all done and we continue to do. Or there's a beautiful bird song going on right now. Let's send it. O- send the focus over there, perhaps. That's right. That's right. So there's the... So uh, there, there comes intention, intent, right. Right. and and that the daily doing of a particular thing, uh, mindfulness, meditation, chant, whatever your practice is, but doing it for a prescribed time on a regular basis is extraordinarily Have important. Have to. Yeah. Have to. So, There's no way around that. Yeah. Intent, but I think if I... Go ahead. No, no, just to talk about, uh, so for I me... I was going to say, though, yeah. Yeah. But that the moving away, back to the bird song, mm. we have to be very, I want to make space for that compassion for, if you're not so identified with that right righteousness and that grievance that you're arguing in your mind, right, then what do you risk? What do I give up if I come back to the bird song? Because we say that. We've done a lot of practice. We can do that. But again, that takes wearing my rightness a little bit lighter because I'm not the sole content of my opinions and my emo- even my emotions that I got hurt by that. And that's the piece I'm arguing over in my head that that was hurtful or whatever it, whatever it is. That is a piece of work to come back to the bird song and let that not be made right. Yeah. yeah. So I, I just want to I want to point out that that's a piece of work that we really have to learn how to do, which has to do with the disidentification with our rightness and coming back to our relatedness, our our intention to live a life that's related and loving. And at peace. And that's part of the choice, right? And there's a lot wrapped up in that choice. Yes, years of practice, just karma, personality, what you come in with and how you relate with uh, objects flying at you yes. from people's yes. minds, right? Yes. Which is the most and as difficult. practitioners, we're not always dealing with awake and aware people, right? So we have to learn how to navigate a world that is, for the most part, identified fully with thought and rightness and opinions and fighting for us to agree with them on their opinions because in order for them to exist, and have any self-esteem, we have to share that opinion because they are that opinion. We're going to be up against that all the time. Yep. Right? So we have to be the light in the darkness that says, do I want peace? Do I want a life that is more expansive? And then it's up to us, you know, with no pity party attached, to continually let go and let go and let go mm. and let go and know that it's okay to let go. We're, we're not giving up anything to let go. Well, usually what happens though, people have such tremendous suffering. The, the thought belief, the story belief, that in, you, you do get to a point, I think, where the intention is so powerful to want to change that then you actually uh, find yourself uh, through mindfulness, which can be extraordinarily helpful. Oh, yes, the bird song. 
right? Yeah. And it it's it just becomes it 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 overtakes the righteousness, which is really what's going on in the in that your particular example, which is a great one because we've all gone there. And when we feel someone's done us wrong, in any way, it's the probably you know very powerful. Very. Powerful. And you're right. It's suffering. It's suffering that is the portal to change, right? Because yeah. we just can't keep doing it that way. We can't. And I think, you know, when you can't do something, you change. Yeah. So, yeah, that that's yeah. what gets us to the cushion usually. And there's some wisdom that awakens that says the way I'm doing this isn't working. I don't want to live in this fight in my mind for the rest of my conscious experience. I don't want to live that. So there's got to be another way other than this arguing my case and reliving it and ruminating. Yeah. 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 Uh, You you, uh, quote at one point Rick Hansen, Dr. Rick, who's great. Yeah, Um, great. And talk. He talks about a negativity bias. This is really when it comes to our attention. Negative information creates more activity in the brain, more firings than positive information of equal intensity. Our brains are also better at noticing the negative than they are at noticing noticing the positive. That's a hard one to. Yeah, human wired. We're wired. Oh God, make it even more difficult. It is. It is. But it makes sense, you know, in our reptilian brain, you know, if if our eye is on the potential predator or danger, Mm. right, if we miss the predator, we're going to be inside that predator's tummy. If we miss the carrot that's hanging on the tree or in the bush, rather, um, yeah, there'll be another carrot. So if we... We have to stay vigilantly focused on what can harm us to stay alive. And that translates, you know, maybe now it's not the predator in the forest. Maybe it's something emotional, like fiercely tuned into where our ego might be harmed or we might be humiliated or, Mm. right, this becomes the that jaguar, right, in the tree. Yeah. And so we're wired that way because I think it's, I think John Gottman said it's five to one in marriages where it takes five positive interactions to counter one negative. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> Which I think is a bit light, but I would say with my husband, maybe 10. But, you know, it is just our wiring that we hold the things that feel most damaging, Mm. most Mm -hmm. upsetting. And um, that's just, that just comes back to survival. So, and so does this sense of separation, just to say one quick thing, you know, when we, when we start to open to being more than just our thoughts, and to being compassion and being awareness and all of that, we're a little bit losing the separate self, right? This sort of me and I protect me and, you know, so on and so on that thoughts are so ingrained with, I got to protect me. Most thoughts have a me in it. So similarly, you know, when we came out of the, you know, uh, when we evolved, as soon as we became this separate cell creature, we started protecting our edges. We started saying, I'm here and you're there. And there's something very survival-y about that. Because when we open to this other space, you know, it's like in, in non-duality, the raindrop doesn't want to become the ocean. It wants to stay a raindrop. And our thoughts are always trying to keep us separate as a separate celled creature that was part of evolution. So my hope in a sense is that evolution continues where we go wider yet again. We've come through our separate places and separate celled beings and that we maybe can be both. 
be the beautiful incarnation, you know, of separate relative beings, but knowing of our non-separateness sort of behind that, if you will. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not to rule out the separate, the separate experience. I like spicy food. You don't, you know, you like scary movies. I don't, whatever your preference is, that's fine. But that there's a larger knowing of being this all. Well, ultimately, that is, uh, we were fortunate, that is the truth. We are not separate. To realize that truth, I, and where you're, what you're saying is perfect, Nancy, it's where we need to start. Yes, we still have our individual preferences and so on, and it's just a matter of attachment that we're not going to club somebody over the head up about it. And at the same time, we have experienced that which is beyond and of course many people do have that ineffable experience beyond separation it can be through psychedelics it can be through an experience with a teacher or it can be through a book it can be through music i mean there's so many ways for that ineffable experience to happen so uh but ultimately it is the truth and it is again all about aspiration and intention to just start where you, this perfectly said, just in the background you can have the idea that we are not separate, just in the background. We're not throwing ourselves on, you know, under a bus because we're just not there. But yeah, uh, and again, Ram Dass, one of his famous things at the end was, we humans can operate on more than one plane of consciousness at the same time. That I, Isn't I've that always loved that. Yeah, yeah I've always loved that. So liberating because I think that that's really misunderstood. That we have to give up this separate self, and and we don't, and we yeah. don't. We do live in a relative frame as well. But yeah. until we can wiggle out, uh, wiggle out our attachment to thought, in a sense, none of this can can happen. That's right. Absolutely. Do you now? I'm bringing up a story that's a very that I saw in the book, read in the book. I don't know. It's a. It's about a patient. Um, I don't know. That's probably not her name. But uh, Sharon, who do you know? Do you remember that story? It's such a powerful story because so I've gotten in in what I do for the foundation. Uh, I, I see a lot of the mail that comes through, the emails that come through, and some people having some really tough losing folks and so Sharon this is, is about the one that. who lost her daughter yeah, yeah. can you tell yeah. that story sure so we again in looking at thought and being on the side of thought um which is necessary as painful as that sometimes is she was a woman who broke my heart um mm. who lost her daughter in a car accident, and I think the daughter was a freshman in, in college when it happened. But um, every day that I saw her over months and months, she talked about her child and talked about it and relived it and relived it and relived regrets and relived many, Brief. many things. Yeah. Mm. And um, after much time and, and listening, I think I asked her very gently, what do you think would happen if you weren't thinking about April every day? Mm. What, what, or what, what are you afraid of? Something along those lines, very gently. And um, she said that, um, I think she said the words were something like, uh, I don't want to ever not think about her all the time because mm. it will be like she's gone. It will be like it didn't happen. It will be like it's over. I, I keep the thinking, I have to keep thinking because it keeps her here and it keeps her from being gone, right? Something along those yeah. lines. Very... And Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And we get it. Common we get too, it. right? I would very, say. Very common. Extremely. Yeah. 
that there is such a sense of in order to honor our suffering, we have to keep thinking about it, right? That um, if we really let ourselves be fundamentally changed in every way and change from the grief and change from all of it, right? Um, that that won't be enough. There is a lack of trust that it having happened has changed us. We don't have to bring the contents in on a moment to moment to moment basis to honor our suffering, to honor that person's presence, to keep reminding ourselves that they matter, right? That's, that's part of us. It's already done. And there is a misidentification with the content of the situation as if that's the thing that honors the meaning. Right? And we treat our suffering to some degree with, with that kind of reverence, right? That <laughs> to, to let our suffering become part of us, but also heal, not heal like it's gone, but move on to re-enter the present moment, right? That that would be some sort of betrayal to the, the pain that we've lived. That would be to leave it on the side of the road, like, oh, we're all good with that now. That That's okay that that happened, or that, that we're done. We're never done with great loss. We've changed profoundly. Um, but we don't have to keep bringing it into every single present moment to honor its meaning. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, very potent. And then that... Um that indulging that we all do. Uh, and it's hard to say that when you've lost a child, to say that w with a straight face, so to speak, because yeah. the profound uh, nature of the loss is extraordinary. But we are human, and, and I think everything you said is right on. And then, but a lot of times, uh, you, you've got wounds can become who we think we are. And, and that identity... Uh, is a very powerful uh, a thing that um, takes us away from being present. That's for sure. It does. It, and the, the power of suffering in terms of identification is, is mm. you know, you can't wrap language around, you know, I'm a domestic abuse survivor. I'm a rape survivor. I'm a PTSD survivor. I'm a all true people, you know, suffer through these things. But just like we were talking about the negativity bias, the power of our traumas to hook us into identity, right? That, that that's who we fundamentally are. And we can turn the radio station any time we want is the truth. We we are under no requirement to be who we were even five minutes ago. Mm -hmm. So we just imagine that these traumas give us some kind of place to reside. They become home. They become, oh, that's how I know myself. I'm that. Well, that we don't have to live there. We can recreate a sense of self in every moment as if we landed here without a storyline, mm -hmm. right? without a narrative on who we are. It's complete freedom. It's complete freedom. And, you know, we talk about in the book, I talk a lot about narratives, right? What, what we're walking around the movie, we're walking around it, which starts out as this is who I am, right? I'm a Democrat. I'm a, you know, person who loves horses. I love blah, 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 whatever. But every moment we're constructing a reality that only exists in our own mind. So part of the getting free from the overthinking is allowing yourself to see who you are in every present moment. Actually, wow. Who? You know, what was I able to do here if I didn't hang on to this story of who I am and all the things that have happened to me? Who could I be in this present moment? It's mm -hmm. really kind of exciting. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I think it's real uh, part of uh, some of your, shall we say, anecdotes, because there's some nice uh, practices here in this book. Very easy to read, everybody, by the way, and not that long. It's right to the point, and everything we've been talking about is elucidated in the book. But uh, learning to directly experience feelings, like uh, getting into the body, into one's body, which has a natural, on its own, it's taking care of stuff, you know, and getting a little bit trusting uh, about being in it rather than uh, thinking every thought is who I am, has nothing to do with anything else. It's like it's a, it's, it's, it's a computer I happen to be carrying around. And uh, I love it because I can indulge the shit out of it in terms of That's every it. stupid thought and then all the scary ones. Yeah, um, yeah talk about that. that, that uh, well, it's very important, I think. Yeah, and the body, what's so remarkable about the body is that it's this direct flight into now. It's this portal to the present moment. All we really have to do is unhook from the thoughts and drop down below the neck, and we're living in the present moment. It's right here. And yet we walk around like little heads cut off yeah. from, you know, like they're not attacked. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's unfathomable. And as you said, you use that word trust. We don't trust that we can actually exist in the body without being hypervigilant about what's happening in our mind. We would be just fine if we just hang out in the body, right? The body takes care of itself. And so for myself and what I teach a lot of people is throughout the day to just do that drop, drop in and check out what's happening in the body. What are the sensations, smells, sounds, right? Become aware of this entire universe. It's taking care of itself. I mean, that's what's also so hilarious to me is this mind runs around saying, it's up to me, it's up to me. It's up to me. I have to control everything. I have to figure everything out. I have to fix everything. And then you have this unbelievable instrument of magic fairy dust and wisdom and what have you going on right below, right below here that is taking care of your existence. And thank goodness does not rely on the mind yeah. to keep us going. Thank right? goodness is right. I, uh, yes, I am all down for what yes. you just said. Yes. And in fact, it reminds me of a mentor that we had back in India when I went back with Ram Das a second time with all the other Westerners. And uh, we actually just finished a documentary about him called Brilliant Disguise. And he was this incredible yogi, but had a family and, and was a school teacher uh, in, the, in the foothills of the Himalayas. Uh, and went into the deepest samadhi states right in front of us, and, um, no pulse, no breath, you know, all of yeah. that. But And he was a, a teacher not by, I mean, he was a teacher by profession, but he wasn't a teacher. He wasn't a, a self-appointed spiritual teacher. He just was our be here now instructor without, uh, you know, and that, that was yeah. always a, a joke. But he used to come up to me at times when he saw the ridiculousness of uh, following these thoughts that I was verbalizing even, it was, and he'd come up to me and he'd sc it'd screw my screw back in and go, my <laughs> boy, if you think you are doing this, you are lost. That's great. Isn't That's it? so perfect. That's so great. Um, the, the, we're kind of at the end of the hour. Uh, the, but, I go back to uh, what are the antidotes here? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. you've got plenty of them in the book. And, and one of them, keep it simple and kind. I mean, I love that above anything else uh, in terms of allowing for, a, just trust that and allow for a path that if you do, just simplify and, and, and not make that mind and thoughts the royal family, 
and just back off a little bit. But to me, uh, here's what you, it's also, as you say, it's in our best interest, <laughs> it's an understatement, to replace our complicated strategizing and dissecting with something, something far simpler, namely compassion. That is the way, for, that is the leverage uh, the basic leverage, and it, uh, that compassion has to include spaciousness and awareness, the gap between the thought, you know, the willingness, the ch- everything that we've been talking about has to include that. But if that is there, the, the heart, and we go back to embodying, you know, trust in the embodiment here, that nature is good, and ultimately we are good. And... Uh, and compassion is the way to open into that in my mind. And I join you 110%, you know, even when we're way down the rabbit hole and making everything a thousand times more complicated than it really needs to be and we're moving away from peace, even in that moment we can stop for a second and say, oh, sweetie, you're really caught right now. You're really in it. You're in the tsunami, Mm. aren't you? (laughs) And you don't know how to get out. And just that move of, I see that. I got you. I care about you right there. Is the beginning of the way out. right? Because it just is so our nature, that loving space. And it's really the, the main ingredient. Yeah. It's the main ingredient that we care about our own experience. Yeah. And we don't want ourselves to suffer. And the more we move towards kindness for ourselves, for our own journey, right? Oh, you've been taught to make things more complicated. You've been taught that you've got to figure, oh, 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 wait, wait. There, There's an easier way here, right? Yeah. Sort of to open up out of the thought and trust that will take you somewhere good. And uh, Ramdas, uh, the last little quotes from him was, um, he had the intent, he didn't quite put it that way, but to wrap himself in the arms of his own kindness. We need to wrap ourselves in the arms of our own mm-hmm. kindness. And that opens the door. And it's, it's, it's practice. And there you go. And practice. <laughs> Yes, uh, I love a, that. Wrap yeah. ourselves in the arms of our own. That is beautiful. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nothing can happen without self-compassion. Nothing. Yeah. It all comes from ego if it's not driven by self-compassion. Yeah. Very good, as they say. Very good. So very, great very good. to see you again, Nancy. <laughs> Lovely uh, to see you, too. Uh, so Till the next you. one. Yeah, thank you very much for being here. Everybody, of course, uh, the... The book, which is out, we'll give you a link to that. And uh, and then the last book that we talked about, uh, the last podcast around tech and uh, the path, spirituality. And a new book coming out November 1st. You do? Oh, you I do, me. The Emotionally Exhausted Woman. Why yeah. we feel so depleted and how to get what we need. Oh, Wow. That's a yes. mouthful. Okay. Well, I know. You'll, you'll, I know. You'll let us know about I'll it. I'll be back. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you again, okay. Nancy Collier. You and uh, this is Mind Rolling on Be Here Now Network. Go to BeHereNowNetwork.com and you'll see the show notes and everything else that you uh, have heard about in this podcast and linked up to Nancy as well. And uh, we'll see you uh, next week.